English and the humanities at Mississippi State. It's not one of our major centers of culture. No, but what was your favorite uh, course to teach? The Victorian poetry. It's very strange. I, uh, want, I, I it shows how far we've come in the post-literate period. Once every month, I would be a Browning reader, if you can imagine this. People would get together. I would read the poetry of Robert Browning. Mm -hmm. And people would stay and listen to it. Can you imagine that happening today? Not today. <laughs> Not There's today. I can't imagine the attention span. No, no. I can no. imagine people saying, I'll wait for the miniseries. <laughs> Yeah, so I miss those golden times, but I really don't, don't miss the acad academic world. Mm -hmm. One benefit, of course, was that lecture notes last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Brownie's not about to write any more poems, and Shakespeare isn't going to write any more plays. Mm -hmm. So whatever you have to say is going to doesn't endure forever. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is your... Oh, no, no. Well, what transitioned you from the academic world into filmmaking? Oh, what well, spawned your interest in filmmaking? What happened was... But even though the academic life is a very pleasant life, mm -hmm. it's a placid life. And uh, despite what you may see in editorials, teachers don't work hard. You have more time off than you can ever imagine what to do with. Mm -hmm. But a fellow I'd gone to school with wanted a television director for his advertising agency back in Chicago. And I couldn't resist it. And so back I came to Chicago, and he said he was about to pick up a huge account and needed me immediately, and it turned out he didn't get the account. So it's one of a great number of midlife crises. But while I was there, we were shooting commercials at a little film studio on Wabash Avenue in Chicago. And the fellow who owned the studio <laughs> said he needed a partner desperately. He was a wonderful technician. He was not a businessman. That was apparent to me in the beginning because right. the deals I was making there where I knew he couldn't make any money on the jobs we were placing. So I bought a half interest in the film studio. His name was Martin Schmidhofer. We called it Lewis and Martin Films because Lewis and Schmidhofer would not have fit on the building. Right. And the big change was switching from 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter. And the reason that I insisted on that was that the major advertising agencies at that time insisted that their commercials be shot in 35 millimeter. Otherwise, they were gonna go to the West Coast and shoot them. So really, as a matter of survival, I bought an ancient Mitchell camera from another film studio was going bankrupt, as they were doing. So one day when I was bemoaning my fate in the film business, I was always writing copy for another advertising agency just to keep body and soul together until the film studio could take hold. Somebody said, how do you make any money in, in your business? I said, you only make money in the film business to shoot features. He said, why don't you shoot features? Which I thought was an idiotic question, like asking why aren't you rich? You, know, you have a lot of control over that. But it started the thought process going. I said, nobody shoots features in Chicago. He says, you're out of your mind. The movie industry started here. Charlie Chaplin made his first movies in Chicago. Uh -huh. Of course, that was a few years back. <laughs> so, next midlife crisis. I uh, put together a bunch of people, and I was the biggest investor. We formed a company called Mid-Continent Films. Okay. And we shot two movies under that name, that banner. And what were those two films? One was called The Prime Time, and the other was called Living Venus. And did they have anything to do with the world of horror or gore? Nah, or nothing or at all, whatever. You see, that's, uh, again, going back to literature, when I was a child, I thought like a child. Uh -huh. And for The Prime Time, as many first-timers do, I was going to be a big shot. I was the producer. I hired a director. Big mistake, because he had no background in shooting features. He had background in shooting beer cans. He was very good at shooting <laughs> bottles of beer, but when it came to directing talent, he had none. Primetime, I felt, was a, a, eventually a disaster, but 
when you're making your first movie, you have no idea what you're getting into. Whether it's going to be a disaster or a smash. Mm -hmm. But Ned Cotton had the exchequer, the backing to make the second picture. Living Venus is about the rise and fall of a Hugh Hefner type character. Okay. And for that one, I felt that I better direct it myself. My ego had been shot down in flames with the prime time. Living Venus was quite a play of the picture. It's still playing today. Prime time has fortunately vanished into oblivion. But the, the distributor, see, the film business is based on distribution, and anybody who tells you otherwise is simply stroking his or her own ego. It's based on distribution, not on uh, production. Anybody, anybody can aim a camera, as witness what we're doing right now. <laughs> But it takes somebody to distribute. Them. Yeah. Well, the distributor for the prime time in Living Venus went bankrupt, owing Midcontinent Films all the film rentals. So there I was. I had no studio. I had sold the studio to get my investment. You see, it's like an O. Henry story. Right. To be in, to make to make that in those movies, I had no friends. They had all invested in Midcontinent Films. Mm. So back to square one. Right. I got a job with another studio in Chicago as their staff director, shooting commercials and business films and that kind of thing. And one fateful day, a fellow named Dave Friedman, who had worked for the defunct distributor, dropped in and he said, I've got a deal if you're going to do it. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, we have a distributor in Dallas, Texas, who will give us $7,000 if we'll make a one-reeler in color with a bunch of pretty girls in it. Uh, the sure $7,000 was a very large budget. It was a huge fortune. Mm -hmm. Because I knew, first of all, I could operate the camera. Mm -hmm. I could cut it. The studio where I was the staff director had a piano, an organ, and a celeste. So I figured I could score the thing myself, and the only cost we would have would be the, the girls, and Dave said he could get those for 50 bucks a day, and we could shoot <laughs> the whole thing in three days. I figured the most this the whole thing would cost us, including film and everything else, would be $2,000, which would give us $2,500 $2, each to split. I said, wow, let's do it. Yeah. Ancient Greek drama had a device they called the deus ex machina, god from machine, in which if the playwright wrote himself into a corner, a god would come down in a basket and solve all the problems. Right. My deus ex machina was a guy named Jack Curtin who represented a New York film laboratory. Mm -hmm. He dropped in and said, what are you working on? No, well, I got this one reeler here and, and, and you call, if you're nice to me, you can do the lab work. He said, I'll do better than that. <laughs> is if you will make a full length, 70 minutes was then considered full length right. movie, no laboratory bills will be due until 90 days after we deliver the answer print. Which meant the only cost, aside from the girls, would be raw stock, that is the actual film itself. Okay. Not the processing, not the work print, just not actually the, buy buying the, film the raw film itself. So Sounds like a good deal. It was a terrific <laughs> deal. And based on that, I made a little movie which we called The Adventures of Lucky Pierre. And this is the movie that's using the pretty girls yeah. in the, the raw film. And it was, yeah. And we had a cast, a, a crew of two. I was the director and cameraman. Dave Friedman was the producer and sound man. In fact, on the sync takes where we had a clapstick, the actors had to use their own clapstick, throw it aside, <laughs> and start acting. We thought nothing of it. Right. It was really hand to mouth, but that really was the, the, the cornerstone. But it's a... There was a fellow in Chicago named Tom Dowd who had a little theater on the edge of the loop called the Capri. Mm -hmm. And he played this kind of movie. And we arranged for Lucky Pierre to open at the Capri. We got the answer print. Now, an answer print is not what it is today, where it's all computerized. Mm -hmm. Then it was all done by eye, and it was dark scenes and light scenes and a, a mess. Right. We played the answer print at the Capri Theater. 
It ran for nine weeks. We made money that you cannot believe so what it, happened. It was a huge success. It was more than a huge success. It was a phenomenon. Phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Because it cost nothing. Mm -hmm. And here was, I remember back with all the work we had done on a huge cruise on on Living Venus in the prime time, and here was Lucky Pierre doing all this business. He had no money in it, money was pouring out. Mm -hmm. On top of which, Tom Dowd, who owned that theater, said, why don't you guys make some for me? And is this what? Well, he's, he felt, why should I be paying film rental to some outsider? Mm -hmm. Because while I would never disclose what movies cost to make, Dave was very proud of the fact that the thing it cost us. It's very money. expensive. Right? Yeah. So he said, well, you know what, we don't even have any. So Tom, Tom, I, see, Tom would say, well, why should I pay these fellows? I can make one. Mm -hmm. But we started a procedure in which we were making movies for everybody. I had an old Volkswagen bus crammed with obsolete equipment. <laughs> Everything in it belonged in the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> but it, it was 35 millimeter movie equipment. I had four master lights. These were ancient lights that worked through a transformer. And so anything we, any set we had to light, we had a light with those four lights or nothing. Or nothing, yeah. But nobody cared. Had a rollicking good time making these movies. And so the next station of the cross, when it got cold, we'd go down to Florida to shoot something. Really, with nothing in mind, we go down and shoot a movie. Just show up and say, we've got the equipment, yeah. we'll figure it out when we get there. Mm -hmm. Either for ourselves or for somebody else, because we became known as the guys who could make movies cheap. And it didn't bother me at all. <laughs> Not at all. With that uh, label. Yeah. So how well, did Blood Feast come out of that? That's how Blood Feast came out of it. We were down in Miami, mm -hmm. uh, shooting for another group. And I said, while we're here, Let's make one for us. But I felt that that genre was becoming overcrowded. The genre of? Of these cute girls dancing cute around girls the dancing sun. dancing around, bikini bays, yeah. having fun on the beach. Yes, because okay. I, it was going, I, I felt it was going in the wrong direction. Uh -huh. And I had young children at the time. I said, uh-uh, what can I do? What kind of movie can I make that the major companies either won't make or can't make? A very short list. Now there is no list. But then I was watching a TV show, I think. And here was this old movie with Edward G. Robinson or somebody, and the police pumped bullets into him, and he died peacefully with his eyes closed and a little speck on his shirt. And I said, hey, mm -hmm. that gives me an idea. Mm -hmm. So Blood Feast was really the result of that plus one other factor. We were staying at a motel in Miami Beach called the Suez. The Suez is one of these schlock motels on the North Beach, and outside the Suez Motel, which gave it its, gave it its name, was a fake cement sphinx. Now, I've been to, the, to Gaza in Egypt and seen the real sphinx, but this, this one outside the Suez was about seven or eight feet tall, but against the sky, a sphinx is a, it's a sphinx. sphinx. Right. So that gave me this idea of the Egyptian a rather exotic overtone. Mm -hmm. And the plot line of Blood Feast, which has now become very well known, a woman goes to an exotic cake. It says Fuad Ramsey's Exotic Catering. There's this very and, interesting character with the eyebrows. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and, and in fact, he had played a beach bum in the movie we had just made for somebody else. But for Blood Feast, he became Fuad Ramsey. His name was Mel Arnold, mm -hmm. who has, over the years since, he's still around, he makes appearances as the original Fuad. He says, Mr. Ramses, I would like to have a party for my daughter, but I don't want it to be like anybody else's party. Madam, and the eyebrows wiggle, have you ever had an Egyptian feast? She says, well, no, but has there been a party like that? Not for 5,000 years. So it turns out that an Egyptian feast and the body parts of young maidens, very hard to find in Miami, by the way. <laughs> Uh -oh. Somebody just got the electric Technical chair. difficulty. Yeah. Cut up and cooked. Mm -hmm. When we were making Blood Feast, we were having just a wonderful time. Without thinking, is anybody ever going to play this picture? And it was the first picture of its kind, There was really. never anything remotely like this. Yeah. In fact, when we opened Blood Feast, we really caught censor boards unaware. There was censorship against nudity. There's not a frame of nudity in Blood Feast. Mm 
There was censorship against obscenity. There's not one four-letter word in blood feast, but there was no censorship about gore because nobody had ever done it. We, in fact, were the progenitors of a lot of the, the legal actions that took place subsequently because people said, hey, we can't have this going on. We better pass a law. Uh -huh. So Blood Feast really stood the industry on its ear. When we were cutting it, I really had a lot of second thoughts because people couldn't watch it, and not because it was rotten acting and a work print full of grease pencil marks, but they said, you can't show that. Because of the gore. Because of the gore, the famous yeah. tongue scene. So we decided to open the movie in Peoria, figuring if we die in Peoria, who will know? Uh-huh. We opened it in Peoria on a Friday, and we couldn't stand it. Saturday, we got to go down there. It's about a three-hour drive from Chicago. We got near the theater, and here's this big traffic jam on the highway. I said, oh, that's all we need, an accident. We were the accident. In one day, the word of mouth had gotten out, and there were two kinds of word of mouth. One, total outrage, how dare they? Two, oh my God, did you Gotta see, see that? Yeah. yeah. And both of them worked in our favor mm -hmm. because people felt that if they didn't see it, they would miss an experience. Right, because it was the first of its kind. It was absolutely, yeah. Oh, there was so there had never been a movie like Blood Feast. And, and no one cared right. that the acting was primitive, that we were using department store mannequins. As Just, body parts, because yeah. they didn't exist at the they, time, I'm yeah. sure. Whereas now people can go to a Halloween store and pick up you bet they fake can. limbs oh. with the gore and people and, take and for rubberized granted. too, which, mm -hmm. yeah. Which I'm sure you would have killed for. Oh, what a difference that would have, <laughs> have made. When we discovered chicken skin and mortician's wax, wow, what a difference that made. <laughs> so Blood Feast really became the watershed movie. That all movies, the horror movies, and even just dramas that use the gore, like yeah. even if you look at things like Gangs of New York, or any movie that has blood. They are all the natural action, descendants of Blood Feast. Blood Feast you know, now by now, I'm sure some, well, somebody would have done it by now. Mm -hmm. But we really smashed the gates open because theaters that originally, when they heard what we were making, said, we'd never play a picture like that, came clamoring to get it. And here we are in October of 2003, and Halloween is coming up, and theaters are going to play Blood Feast. The original Blood Feast, all these years later, still plays, and many, many films that have been made with a big budget strut and fret their hour upon the stage and then are seen no They're 15 more. minutes of fame whereas Blood Feast yeah. has endured. But Blood Feast has endured. How, how old is Blood Feast? Blood Feast was shot in 1963. So that's... Yeah. Just the 40 year I said to Dave... The 40 we, year uh, 40 years ago. Well, I said when we saw it, the, I couldn't believe the business it was doing. I said, what if we made a decent one? <laughs> so... That's when the idea came for 2000 Maniacs, which today, this day, is my favorite movie. You asked me that question it earlier. Is, yeah. And there's, in my opinion, no comparison between Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs. Mm -hmm. But Blood Feast is the one that did the business. Blood Feast the is the reason really I'm a footnote to motion picture history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel to know that so many people look up to you and that they admire you for your work and that you really had a big impact in so many filmmakers' lives and in the movie industry altogether? Originally, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing because I knew how little we had put into these movies. But subsequently, when I see how much the film industry has either evolved or devolved, depending on how you want to interpret it, based on that, I am truly delighted to be regarded in that respect. I don't mm -hmm. want it on my tombstone. Yeah. I don't want them to say, here lies the guy who started gore movies. Well, I mean, even there you could look at movies like Schindler's List, where people were very taken aback by what boundaries they seemed to break, but they wouldn't have been able to have broken those boundaries had it not been for movies like Blood Feast that yeah, well, allowed Blood, yeah, that to I, even I, be on I screen. hear constantly that major directors are aware that Blood Feast was the movie that started it all. And it's like Melier's Voyage to the Moon, which you mm -hmm. look at and laugh, but it was, it was the first. The Great Train Robbery was the first of its type. And it's, 
Orville and Wilbur Wright, their plane flew, what, 120 feet? Mm -hmm. But if it hadn't flown 120 feet, we wouldn't have the 777. Right. So there's a historical perspective there, which I certainly am not going to deny. I mm -hmm. revel in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm just thrilled to have lived this long. Because a lot of people, until mm -hmm. the internet brought me into everybody's living room, thought I had long since died. Or <laughs> but you're alive and well. And well, I'm here. And you even have a, a career after this, which has more to do with, I guess, you, you would say your original roots. Yes, I never did quit the, mm -hmm. the world of marketing. And as I think I told you a while ago, I've written 27 books on marketing. I am well thought of in that business. Not at all the way it is in, in, in the movie business. See, in mm -hmm. the movie business, I'm regarded as something of a, a, a freak who happened by accident to stumble on a formula that has now become standardized. Mm -hmm. The way Goodyear... Einstein did, yeah, or, yeah. Well, uh, more right. like Finkelstein. Finkelstein. <laughs> but in the world of marketing, uh -huh. I, I, have, I, I say that with some ego, I command a little more respect mm -hmm. because the, I, I write books, I write articles, I am on a consulting basis with major marketers. Mm -hmm. And until, again, the internet exposed me, the two worlds didn't collide at all. Now, when you go out to your different speaking engagements, they know, they know that it's one and the same. Yeah. A truly Renaissance man who is with yeah. many very successful lives. Most people would kill just for one successful career, whereas you've been fortunate throughout your whole life. Yes, I have. I think I'm one of the luckiest guys on the planet. <laughs> well, let's ask, um, do we have any more questions for the you want to talk about Jimmy and the... And okay, the how did you get involved with Jimmy and April and the whole Chainsaw Sally experience? I met Jimmy and April when I was here in Baltimore for something or other and became impressed with them as nice people. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I met some nice people, and let it go at that. Mm -hmm. Well, then Jimmy sent me a, a video, which I found impressive. And what and video was that? I think uh, Scream, what was it called? Silver Scream? Silver Scream. Okay. And we entered into an email correspondence. One of the strange evolutionary aspects of the 21st century Email differs from any other type of communication. Mm -hmm. It's not like a phone call. We've got to think right then and then, oh, why did I say that? Yeah. It's not like snail mail where the gap between messages is so great. We forget that, what the original yeah, was. Yeah, and the source. impact is gone. Yes. Email has its, its own universe. And in fact, one of my books is called Effective Email Marketing. It's a major marketing medium and growing. So we became email pals, I guess you'd call it. Uh, guys, can I uh, get you over here? Back here. I'll, one more sentence and I'll complete. Yeah. So I got an email from him saying, hey, I'm going to make a movie. Do you want to be in it? And I said, you got to be kidding. What would uh -huh. I possibly do? He says, no, if you're available at all, be in my movie. Well, it turned out that timing is perfect because I, here I am in Baltimore. I've got to be in Rochester, New York tomorrow. So it's right on the way. And I had a good time today. We've had a wonderful time with you and getting to meet you and just experiencing the man that is Herschel Gordon Lewis. Thank you very much. <laughs> I guess we got that much.